right. geographically, how close was I? I was um, on the northern end of Old Town. So. I'm working as a, a journalist uh, at the time, so very interested in you know nonfiction media, and also had aspirations to become a documentary filmmaker. And uh, I was just wandering around, as I say, like not too far from where I lived, and I ran across the stone marker, you know, the commemorating Alexandria as the site of the nation's first uh, sit-in in 1939. And you know, like. Um, probably most Americans, at least at that time, outside of Alexandria, uh, you know, I thought the sit-in movement began, you know, in the South in the 1960s with a bunch of lunch counter protests, right? So I was, I was kind of blown away by that fact. Um, so all this was kind of swirling in my head, and then one day it just kind of popped in my head, this really should be a documentary, this should be a story that should get out to a wider audience. And that's kind of what launched me on it. Yeah, well, it, it just seemed, you know, pretty obvious uh, that uh, if I was going to embark on this project, I had to collaborate with the center, you know, that's the repository of then and now of black history and African American history, like in Alexandria. So um, I just literally walked in one day and uh, Audrey and Lewis Hicks, who was the director at the time, were here, and I, I told them I was just you know, smitten with this story, and I really thought it should be a documentary. And uh, I, I guess I was just passionate and persuasive <laughs> enough that they agreed to collaborate with me. But we, you know, we, we got it done. And they were, um, to put it short, you know, invaluable resources throughout uh, the whole process. You know, they steered me towards um, all the research sites that I needed to go to to get background on it, help me with, you know, help connect me to folks that I needed to interview for the project, uh, help connect me to images for it as well. So they were, uh, it just couldn't have been done without them. That was 1998. So that was the spring of 1998. So in August of 1999, that was the 60th anniversary of the Senate. I think I may be skipping a hit head here, but we actually released, you know, the documentary shortly after that 60th anniversary. There were some politics, you know, swirling around it as well, because it was the 250th anniversary of Alexandria. And Alexandria is a city, you know, that's mostly been known for celebrating its white history <laughs> throughout its history. I, I, I can't really speak to the last you know, quarter century as well, but uh, there was you know, definitely a sentiment in the city at the time um, that something needed to be done you know, to chronicle the African-American history you know, uh, as well. So, um, so there was some of that you know, politics kind of you know, fueling the, the drive to get it done at that time. So some of you know the funding for the project uh, came out of my own pro out of my own pocket. Uh, I also you know very generously received a, a grant from the Office of His Historic Alexandria, so that actually helped you know underwrite a lot of the production and post production costs of it. Yeah, that's an interesting story. Um, you, I think you asked like what one of the um, roadblocks yes. was, you know, in, in getting it done. And probably the most significant one was the the one remaining participant, you know, the one living participant um, in the sit-in was Buddy Evans, right? And he was still alive in the summer of 1999, and we were going to do an interview with him. So um, my co-director, Eddie Becker, and I showed up at his house. He was in, um, in Washington, living in D.C. at the time, in the summer of 1999. And um, one of his family members came to the door and told, told us he had had a stroke, you know, the day before. Yeah, so uh, that was very sad news, you know, for his family. Um, also sad news, you know, for, for the film. You know, because I, I was kind of relying on him <laughs> to kind of tell the story, at least, you know, from a contemporary uh, standpoint. 
So uh, I read the project, frankly, it might be sunk, you know, at that point. Uh, but I talked to Audrey, and she saved our, ba saved our bacon. Um, she, um, and you'll have to confirm this with her, I think she was an undergrad at University of Virginia. And she had a, a professor there, um, William Elwood, who had made this wonderful documentary in the 1980s called The Road to Brown. And he went around kind of throughout the South, you know, interviewing all these uh, veterans of the Civil Rights Movement about, you know, the uh, struggle that, that led to Brown versus Board of Education. And he had hours and hours of footage. And included in that was some interviews with Sam Tucker and Buddy Evans, and actually Otto Tucker, Sam's, you know, brother as well. And um, Audrey connected me to Dr. Elwood, and he just said, yeah, sure, you can have whatever you want <laughs> from the collection. So, uh, so Audrey and Dr. Elwood really saved it. Um, and, you know, if you see the, the documentary today, you know, that's a lot of his footage that's in there. Eighties, yeah. So um, he did do uh, the, you know, is it was it the New Kent case? He argued that before the Supreme Court in 1968, and that was the one where, you know, the um, Southern states had basically been resisting seg segregation or desegregation uh, for years, and so the Supreme Court kind of pointed a finger at them and said, "No, you, you have to take care of this now." And Tucker was the one that made that argument, you know, before the Supreme Court. Yeah. Um, you know, especially with everyone that I collaborated with, um, the people that work with me on the production, post-production, working with, you know, Audrey and, and Lewis and the other historians as well. Um, I would say, you know, the biggest success that always, you know, sort of sticks out in, in my mind, and I think understandably so, is towards the end of 1999, Audrey might remember the date better than me, I was not there unfortunately, but the city council of Alexandria uh, had at a meeting uh, to name the new elementary school, you know, in the west end of Alexandria. And, and interestingly, you know, the two names that they were considering were Sam Tucker and Armistead Booth, who was outside of the courtroom, you know, fighting the, the litigating the case, you know, uh, in, in 1940 uh, over the sit-in. And um, they showed the documentary, and then afterwards they unanimously voted to name it after Sam Tucker. So I don't think that was me, but I think, you know, if watching that film helped persuade them, you know, that this was something that needed to be done, uh, I don't know what else I can say. That, that you know, is, is certainly a great success and what I'm most proud of, you know, associated with this film. Yeah, I haven't been there um, in quite a while, uh, but uh, I did see, um, I went onto their website uh, this week and that they put up that BLM mural, mural I should say, uh, recently, like a couple months ago, and uh, that's just wonderful. It's wonderful that the kids there are, um, you know, having a sense of like social justice like instilled at them at that age, you know, for sure. I wish I had better recollection. So I knew, you know, we had our first screening uh, at the Resource Center um, in 1999. And then, um, you know, there were a series of, of public screenings uh, uh, around the DC area, you know, for maybe like the, the next uh, year or so. Um, it did screen at a, a couple of uh, festivals, including the Rosebud Film Festival. I don't know if that's still in existence anymore, but that was in Washington. Won an award there. Years later, it screened at the inaugural um, Alexandria Film Festival, and I think that's still around. Uh, but they it won like the inaugural like best documentary you know award at that festival as well. Um, it, is, it aired on a couple of public television outlets. There was a independent public television outlet uh, named WNVC TV in Falls Church, so they aired it in 2000. Also, um, the PBS affiliate in Pittsburgh aired it as well. Um, and then later in 2000, um, 
it got picked up for distribution by California Newsreel, which is you know a big uh, catalog and distributor of films to the education market, I would say primarily. I actually don't know if they're still in existence, but uh, they, um, so they had, you know, for about a decade, um, you know, exclusive distribution rights on it. So I, it, but we did have like a carve out, you know, in our deal so that the, um, the resource center could sell its own, you know, copies of the DVD as well. Um, but, you know, that having that deal sort of limited somewhat, you know, what I could do with it, you know, at, at that point. But yeah, it got out, you know, quite a bit. Um, I don't know that it really took the world by storm, but <laughs> so, but it's, it's a story that, you know, um, continues to fascinate and, and, you know, in, in this area and, and resonate as well. Well, it was, uh, so when we made the film, uh, we shot it, uh, like all the interviews on mini DV, I don't know what the hell it shot his films on, but we eventually mastered on a format called Betacam. <laughs> yeah, and it's obsolete, you know, I think now, but um, or it's not used anymore, right? Uh, but so we still have like a few Betacam masters of it, and that's what we created the DVD like copies from. Well, um, I guess I would to that question kind of give sort of like, you know, what is a very generic answer that a lot of filmmakers would, and that is you just wish you had more money, you know, to make it with, um, you know, to make it, I think it looks good. And it's obviously a film that resonates with people, but you know, I look at it sometimes and I think, you know, I wish we had um, more money to stage that reenactment uh, sequence. Um, you know, we, it was a crunch in post-production, you know, we um, booked some uh, space in a local um, post house, you know, to do it. And I wish we'd had more time, you know, to do it. Um, my co-director was uh, Eddie Becker. He was also the cinematographer and he was using a Sony and many DV camera to shoot it on, which was fine. But, you know, there were better cameras available at that time. So it'd been nice to have more money you know, to do it. There was, I don't know that this is a moment that I really regret not having captured, or an interview that I regret not having captured, but I did uh, contact uh, Howard Smith Jr. and it was his father that presided over the um, trial that, you know, of Tucker um, when he was a youth, when he was arrested, you know, for sitting in the wrong seat, like in a streetcar. And his um, father was a pretty unapologetic you know, supporter of segregation when he was a congressman. So his son, maybe not surprisingly, didn't want to talk to me. <laughs> he gave me a pretty curt response you know, when I talked to him on the phone. So when I got off, I was like, well, that's not happening. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, um, it would have been fascinating you know, to, to get that interview. So to try hearing somebody def defend this system, I suppose. But. Right, well, so my, my work now, um, you know, like a lot of creative types, um, I have a day job. So I um, work in development for a social justice uh, nonprofit. So, um, you know, certainly the same passion that I uh, had for this project and, you know, how, or for the documentary and, and, and how it told the story of the civil rights struggle, certainly that fuels, you know, the, the work um, that I do for this social justice. It's a, it's a, a legal defense, public, you know, def defender uh, law firm. Um, you know, um, you know, I, I think, you know, the way it should have probably affected me is I take away a message like, you know, the, what is the, the quote, uh, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it always bends towards justice, right? But, you know, I, I, and I made it in my 20s, and I suppose I was a, a little bit more of an optimist then, then, but, you know, now I'm in my 50s, and since that time, you know, we've had the, the war on terrorism, we've had the Trump administration, we've had uh, George Floyd, and 
gun violence that just never stops and climate change and so on and so forth. So I, I don't know that, you know, I feel that way <laughs> about the direction that America is headed. So sorry to, you know, cast sort of a, um, you know, a dark note on things with that. But that being said, you know, what, what do you do with that? You know, when, when you have that sort of realization, well, you know, you put your tail between your legs and do nothing or you try to make whatever difference you can, right, in the world. I, you know, this, so I, I always saw this film, um, I always saw this story as, you know, part of a, one piece of a, a, a larger puzzle, you know, in telling the story of the, you know, the, the larger um, civil rights struggle, um, you know, uh, he did. Sam Tucker, you know, didn't uh, litigate uh, Brown versus Board of Education, you know, personally, but this was kind of a critical test case, you know, that, that proved out that, you know, these arguments could be made, you know. And so, by the same token, does anyone think, you know, Dr. King, like, you know, single-handedly? ushered like the Voting Rights Act through. No, I mean, you know, there's many, you know, players involved in the process and many steps along the way. And, and similarly, like the sit-in is, you know, is one of those steps, right? It was one of those steps.